Hello and welcome to the Praise World Podcast, the 2012 series, which is now going to be on the YouTube channel. I'm Kenneth, your host. Joining me today are the founder of both the YouTube channel for Praise World and the forum itself over the past nine years, David. Hello. And other forum members, Dave. Hello. And Liam. Hello. So, very wide topic, the reimagining of old franchises and whether that's good or bad for the actual series. In fact, the first one we could talk about is Hitman. Obviously, Square Enix bought up IDOS. Am I right in thinking that Square Enix took the development away from IO Interactive, or is it still them? It's still them. It's still them, but Jesper Kid's not doing the music now. Yeah, and it's not the same voice actor either. Do you reckon those changes are going to have a negative effect on the game, given that Tomb Raider's now on its third developer? Well, there was a recent gameplay video, which I think got most people's hopes back up again. It didn't look quite so action-y as okay. I had done on past uh, trailers and clips we'd seen. Yeah, I don't think it was just the fact that they've not brought back people from the previous games that they got in to do it that was what people were worried about because in the run-up to this game, they announced it what, two years ago and we've only just recently seen actual footage of the in-game levels. But for the last two years, they've just been coming out of all these statements about how they're trying to uh, make it more accessible and more action-y for people that didn't want to have, have to stealth their way through the levels. And I think a lot of people were worried about that. Like Luckily, you can turn it all off if you want the pure Hitman experience. And they have been highlighting that, so clearly it's something they're aware of. Yeah, I know like, I know. I brought up Hitman when we orig- having recently seen that video. I don't think Hitman's anything to really worry about too much. I, I don't think it will stray too much from what we all expect it to be now. Two franchises where there there have already been radical departures are Splinter Cell. One level was all about get, getting out of jail, and the other one was Ghost Recon, and Ghost Recon's coming back. But, so what kind of radical changes are there to that? Well... Splinter Cell's not really a stealth game anymore, is it? That looked to be pretty much exactly the same as how the direction they took with Conviction. Anyone who's played any of the previous Splinter Cell games knows that Conviction wasn't really a single thing like Splinter Cell. David, you're the Ghost Recon fan, so what's different about that? You've, you have played them all, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, I've played them all. Yep, so what's the proposed differences in the new one it really is a bit of a it's a bit of a leap a leap away from what there was before because it's mostly based on the success of the console games rather than the pc games yeah so it's more it's a lot more console orientated third person there's still a lot of fun to be had in it in co-op but it's really not a, a ghost recon game advanced warfighter on the console they were third person shooters as well weren't they yeah they, everything was on the console yeah but i think future soldier takes it a step further and makes it a lot more like in the gears of war formula because oh it's dear. it's like a pop up 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 and down cover base shooter where you're constant it's just essentially gears of war i don't remember ever really seeing that when i played Warfighter all those years ago. The covers there to be used or not used, obviously it's real it's optional. It isn't Alla Gears of War where it really means maintains that's the only way to stay alive because it isn't. Obviously you've got the the camo option as well, which is automatic. Sorry, the camel option. <laughs> <laughs> the camel camouflage option. Oh right. So it's automatic when you crouch, if you stand up in your camo and you, if you move it goes off. So no, I I wouldn't compare it to Gears of War. I mean games like Matt's Payne Three and, and other games that have used cover based systems, those those are more akin to Gears of War. Um I know it may look like it from Ghost of Ghost Reek on the new one from videos maybe, but people aren't playing it right because you can just go prone, you can find all optional ways rather than just using cover. You see I'm not sure how I like the whole going prone and crouching to automatically stealth idea because it, it, it seems to take something away from the whole stealth mechanic if it just happens automatically when you crouch down at first you kind of think this is going to make things too easy but Ghost um, Recon isn't about stealth though is it it's about being slow and methodical and just going p- peeking around corners and then popping still, out taking a shot and popping back in it's not about stealthing around and then butchering everyone with the uh, automatic it's targeting all, it's, Dave, it's, still, it's still maintained all that kind of stuff is still maintained it's really down to the player if you want to abuse the camo system, then you can obviously but abuse the you, camo system. <laughs> <laughs> you still, you can still get spotted if you if you're. Um, a few feet in front of an enemy you're moving around you, they, they can actually see the, the, the camouflage slightly blurring moving around so they get suspicious you can be seen you've got to really st- even stay still in front of an enemy so, it, so it you think a, it's, a, it's a good direction that they've taken this, no, this series I, no, it, no I'm not saying it's an entirely good direction I'm saying that I've had to, I've just adjusted to it and you think it was necessary no I don't think it was necessary no but it, I think it's helped the, the franchise stay alive but because that's what people probably expected from it now look at Ground Branch which was a, a Kickstarter option that someone tried to do, and it, that was promising a return to you know the, the original form of uh, Ghost Recon and the Rainbow Six as they both started out. It failed to get even funded, so obviously people majority have moved away from that kind of play now. And games like Splinter Cell 
the way conviction went and everything else and it's still going it's the way Ubisoft returned everything it's really just it's either run with it or you've lost an, an IP that you've loved for a long time yeah and plus if it's Ubisoft what we don't know is whether they're going to have their always on piracy checking going along as well that that isn't that doesn't really help you know keep the old players loyal and summed it up on the forum perfectly really where they said um, I can't remember who it was Ubisoft Ubisoft's entire plan is to make the Assassin's Creed game uh, IP the Ghost Recon IP the Rainbow Six IP making them all merge into the same kind of game because they're all be- becoming so integrated with one another now. They used to be they used to be quite distinct and separated, but they're all kind of very same now. Future Soldier is still enjoyable, but it's really doesn't. It's not going to fulfil all, all the needs that you probably had from the older games. But Max Payne 3 was finally released, and Dave, you've played loads of that. So how does that compare with the other two games, which were? But it's wait. Does number three ditch the kind of in between comic book panel storytelling mechanic? Yeah, all, all that stuff's kind of kind of out the out the window now. Elongated, extended, cuts, unskippable scenes. The the one thing I like most about the new Max Payne is the character. That Max was a lot more well-rounded, and I just I, I enjoyed the character a lot more. The single player is good. The multiplayer absolutely blows chunks. Absolutely. Oh yeah. It's just, it's just the same thing where you know it's anybody like matches, isn't it? Yeah, it feels very tacked on compared to everything else. Um, right. And it's a thing where you can still you can still slow time and everything, but it just there's just nothing to it. How's that work in multiplayer? You've got. It's a reward kind of system where you've got to, if you get the kills, you get to control the time. All right. So if you and don't does it slow down for everyone? Yeah, it slows down for everyone, but it's on marginal compared to what it is in the this campaign. So it's, it's not very good. The yeah, it sounds like they struggled to think of how they could implement that into multiplayer. Yeah. That's, it, it, that could, that it comes strike me as a great idea. It reminds me of Time Shift, though. Do you remember Time Shift? Yeah, I love Time Shift. That that had the uh, the whole s- slowing of time feature in the in the multiplayer mode, except I think it only happened in a certain area, in like mm. a bubble. That whole that whole game was built around s- reversing time to solve puzzles and stuff. It, it just doesn't the work. Multiplayer works really well. It, it doesn't work on multiplayer on this because it, it gives that it gives that advantage. And if you're not if you're not getting kills, then you just you might as well not be playing. It's quite, pretty pointless otherwise. It gives the player who was winning the advantage to be able to slow time and thus get even more kills. Yeah, it yeah. seems a bit stacked against those who can't can't get to the top of the leaderboard. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it really does the the, the cold cover system thing is just kind of is quite painful as well in multiplayer because you have to rely on it every moment of every second pretty much. Do you die easily then? You, you die, yeah, you just die easily. It's, it's, I've seen I've seen a few videos of cover system being quite dodgy and people trying to get into cover and then getting shot yeah, to pieces. Yeah, it's kind of like. A, um, like it is in GTA 4 sometimes where, where you're trying to do it and it's not exactly doing what you want. Yeah, it's not the um, smoothest of engines, is it? Yeah, it's, it's quite counterproductive in, in, in it. It's just kind of like, yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't really see why they did multiplayer whatsoever. Does all the general issues that we've discussed about Assassin's Creed, well, the, all of the Ubisoft games, do, do all of those kind of negative effects for a modern update to a game, do they also affect Diablo 3? Or not. Diablo 3 is more of its problems come from being too much of a, a classic, trying to be... Uh, too much like Diablo 1 and 2. I don't think they pulled it off, really. How do you think it's too much trying to emulate the previous games? Because the way I see it, I think they did a pretty good job of that, and I think they ruined the whole thing with the notion of the, the auction house and how the loot system works because it's all so heavily focused on microtransactions. I don't think they did a too bad a job trying to generally emulate the previous games. The actual gameplay is pretty good, but there's no variation in it. It just is... Playing at level 1 is exactly the same as playing at level 30, and it's really not too different at playing at level 60 or whatever it goes up to. It's, well, was, it, it, was that ever the case in action RPG games? I don't really remember Diablo 2 ever really being that varied. You, you just crawl up the tech tree as you uh, level up and gradually unlock little things, but the core gameplay doesn't really ever change, does it? Uh, I don't know what it was about Diablo 2, but there was something interesting. I mean, I felt like I, sh- I, I wanted to get to the end game on Diablo 2, whereas in Diablo 3, I feel like it's all I'm doing is making that damage per second number go up a bit more. Um, yeah. Whereas in Diablo 2, I really felt like I was making progress. I don't know what it is about I think perhaps it's, perhaps it's something to do with the, the new skill tree that they use on the third game and how streamlined it is and simplified. Because obviously there's no stat allocation beyond what you slot into your armor because it's all every time you level up, it's automatic. Yeah. And there's only, what, 20 skills per, per uh, class with the rune modifiers. So... It never really feels like you're dedicated to a build that you want to see through all the way up to level 99 like in the previous game. It's just you just gradually work your way slowly through the game, trying out all these different skills that you gradually yeah. unlock. And there's, it's just, yeah, I can yeah. see how you can uh, 
find it not quite as addictive as before. It's not so much the character development. In fact, I quite like the new spell system of you can try out anything and you don't, you're not committed. You don't have to. The problem with Diablo 2 is if you made, if you put points into the wrong skill at level 3 and then you only realized at level 48, there was nothing you could do about it. You had to play the whole game again, all the way through to level 48 again to get back to where you were, but having corrected your skill yeah, points at level 3. Diablo 2 was sort of less taxing in re-leveling all the way up to level 50 or whatever because it was so quick. You could easily power your way through the campaign and get yourself up to level 60 quite quickly, whereas in Diablo 3 it's a very slow, arduous process. It took me a very long time to reach level 60. Yeah, well, I, I did enjoy the first playthrough, and I did play it through, um, I don't know, three or four more times just to try and get my character up to level 60 but yeah every time I was just losing enjoyment and it was just just get through this act just get through this act just get through this act and I'll be level 59 and then I can just get through this act and then I'll be level 60 and it was it was just a matter of getting through it at that point it was no enjoyment I see so in general the new Diablo kind of divided fans oh big not? time I think a lot of people were very unhappy with uh, Blizzard's attitudes towards the auction house and the subsequent patches to the game that have made it harder and harder to work your way through the, the last difficulty mode and harder and harder to get good drops forcing you essentially to rely on the auction house yeah they've es- essentially they've taken they've taken what they knew made Diablo 2 a great success and so long lasting people still play it after how many years 12 years they've taken the grind from Diablo 2 and they've tried to monetize it basically and that's what's really struck a sour tone with all of the fans. A lot of people don't want to have to pay money for these items. They want to be able to, be able to grind them out slowly and enjoy it. But instead, there's a low-level cap. And once you've hit it, there's not really much else to do other than get items to sell on the auction house and yeah. buy items off the auction house. It's sort of There isn't really an end game beyond the auction house. Yeah, that, that, that was my problem with it. The end game is just there's, there's nothing to it. And I think everyone's selling on the auction house. I don't know if anyone's buying. Who's going to buy a level 60 item apart from someone already at level 60? And if they're already at level 60, why do they need... They can just grind it out themselves. There's no need to put any money into it. Well, because it takes so damn long to actually get anything worth value. I did quite a yeah, lot of what, stuff on you Inferno have... mode and I never got anything. Yeah, but uh, that's kind of my point. If you buy something, you buy a weapon, and then what are you are going to do with it? All you're going to do is grind out until you Use get a better it. weapon. And if you're spending real money on it, then you, you're possibly spending five to 10 pounds on an item which you'll see your stats increase by what a couple of thousand damage you're going to be spending money on minor upgrades already I suppose, if you, I suppose if you embrace the whole idea and you did want to grind it out and get all the high level items and then keep repeating so that you could sell stuff on the auction house to make money yourself, then there's quite a large market for that for people that do want to do that. But people who just want to enjoy the game and play it through to the end. Yeah, I just... would like to see some stats on how, mu- how many people are actually buying stuff off that auction house because I get the feeling it's not many. I get the feeling that almost everyone's selling. And just to compare it to another game, um, completely different game, but um, Terraria had a much more interesting end game where you, you were still searching for new weapons but all the items and weapons you found actually had new abilities and had sort of radically changed the gameplay unlike Diablo where it's just an, another number I haven't played Terraria, but yeah, I can. I think Diablo 2 had that to a certain extent. A lot of the higher level items you found in Diablo 2 did have characteristics and stats on them that changed the game a little bit, so that whenever you found something new, it would prove to be more interesting. Because like the rune words that you use, they gave you different buffs and whatnot that granted you new abilities that your class otherwise wouldn't normally have. I, th- I think they have acknowledged, though, there is a problem with the end game. So maybe we'll see it fixed in a patch or probably in a. I yeah, they're, sort of they're working D- on patch DLC. 2.0 aren't they? Yeah. So I, I will try it again once they, they update the end game, but I'm pretty much done with it for now. Yeah, I haven't touched it in weeks, I think. Which is yep. a shame, because I thought I'd really dig it for a long time, because I used to play a lot of Diablo 2. It just turned into a chore by the end, and it wasn't yeah. fun to play. Though I think in part, it's also to do with the fact that the campaign isn't actually that good. In, in comparison to the previous game, I don't think it's as memorable. I liked Act 1 through 3. Act 4 is just a bit of a chore. You see, I only really liked 1 and 3, mainly 3, because yeah. they actually, it felt like 3 did something new, because I'd never, until then I'd never seen isometric RPG do stuff like that, with the stuff scaling the walls. Oh up. yeah, the graphics are great, but also the scale of Act 3, with you, I mean, that's the one with all the hundreds of mobs. That's where I think Diablo 3 actually excels, when you've got loads and loads of stuff on screen. And you have to actually manage like, which creeps you're going to go for first. And you have to use all your skills to survive. The, the, I think that's the, probably the best act. If there was more of that, I'd play it. 
what I didn't realise about the about Diablo 3 was that the auction house was two way and that other players would be it's almost like an eBay for Diablo that other players would be selling their weapons yeah yeah. Blizzard takes a nice little cut out of every transaction well that's actually a, that's actually a really good segue point to go to free to play games because as you said there's lots of Diablo players out there who actually relish the grind and they actually like the fact that they can spend hours and hours and hours working on the same weapons to get them up to maximum and obviously there are plenty of when it comes to the free to play model depending on which game it is whether it's Tribes whether it's Blacklight Revolution or Defense of the Ancients the new Mech Warrior that's coming up if people aren't going to put money into them and advertising isn't going to help to fund them then yes then there's going to be a, then it's just a question of how the game's economy is going to work and so yeah. it's kind of interesting that the Diablo that there's a the, there's a large contingent of Diablo 3 players that want to spend a- ages and ages and ages grinding away at the game. But when it came to Tribes Ascend, when it when it was launched onto Steam, there were 5,000 floating players that gave it a try and then moved on to Blacklight Revolution because they didn't want to put in the same kind of time that people had when they were playing with the beta from last December. As, as I've just mentioned, I, some of us were just playing King, Kingdoms of uh, Amalo instead and enjoying that for what it was. Yeah. Rather, rather than getting up, caught up in all the hoopla surrounding... Diablo 3, which I did play the trial of, but never really felt engaged enough to to buy for 45 pounds from from BattleNet. Well, that was well, that was part of the problem. Just like StarCraft 2, just like World of Warcraft. Obviously, it's got to be. It's always on. You're you're locked to the PC, and you can't. Was it 20 pounds? In no, oh, okay though. So some people some people got it for 20 pounds if they pre-ordered. Well, yeah, but three years in advance, so it's, that's, that's not really. I mean, even though there are probably lots of fans who did pay that. But there were a lot of people who were just thinking, well, it's, that's like putting, that's like a twenty pound pre order for Duke Nukem Forever. It, it, it still came off as a bit as quite a mass disappointment to me. All, all my friends bought it, and and none of them are playing it now. Whereas th- these are the same friends who are still playing Diablo Two and have right. been doing for a long, long time. But I don't want to be too negative because I did enjoy the first playthrough. I just don't think it has the same lasting appeal that Diablo Two had. Should free to play games make you spend loads of time? There are some where it's almost like it's an MMO, really, but unless you pay. And, you know, put money in. For me, I don't see how it would work any other way, to be honest. Because if it was easy to acquire all of these upgrades, like how slow Tribes is, if it was, if you could just get everything within a week or within a few days, then there'd be absolutely no impetus for people to spend money on it. Who would want to spend fifteen pounds on gold to buy items that they could grind <clears> out in the space of a couple of hours? Well, the cheapest gold is six pound forty. As we record, the the special offers just finished where it was down to three pounds seventy four because we've all played the game except Liam. There's two forms of currency in there. It's a fairly good model that if you pay once, doesn't matter how much you pay for that that one single transaction, whether it's £3.74 or £6.60, after that you get 50% more XP forever and that obviously helps you along the way if, if you only earn and spend xp for having played the actual game and that does help you along a little bit further i think tribes is one of the only free free to play games that i've played that has really nailed the whole microtransaction business i think they really got it got it done well how you can if you like you can just buy everything straight away or grind it out slowly oh absolutely and then for the fifth or patch, you, you can you can buy additional xp modifiers can't you if you just want to i don't know how much they are presumably they're cheaper than the real weapons that you can buy for real money but yeah i think 24 hour boost is 240 gold three days 400 and then for the seven day and then the 30 day they're obviously four figures yeah, I think that's a much better system than what Blacklight uses, where oh, you spend you spend real money on packs for items, but half of the stuff that you unlock is only available for a week. So you can unlock thermo grenades and extra assault rifle attachments or whatever, but you've only got it for seven days, and then you need to buy them again. Yeah, just, that's that, that's um, that's more like a subscription service than a, a free-to-play game, just making money off of a couple of one-time transactions. Everyone's going to spend a little bit of money on tribes at some point, and that's how they're going to make money out of it. But Blacklight, if you want to keep getting these weapons you have to keep pouring money into it yeah what also what tribes what high res studios who made tribes ascend also did right was that the facebook offer it's one time for everybody and that's it it's not you can get more game points but you have to annoy everyone on your friends list by spamming every 24 hours to get 150 game points that's ridiculous whereas with tribes you get to one like 250 gold you still don't have to put any money in if you don't want to but they'll just give you free gold as a one-time thing 
for when you start the game and it doesn't matter whether you've downloaded the game through steam or not that's the other genius thing but blacklight revolution i pray dave when you've when you tried it you found that it was really maxing out your both your pcs wasn't it yeah it wasn't it wasn't very hardware friendly during the beta so i had to lower quite a lot of stuff but i agree what dave said earlier about the because i remember actually unlocking a lot of stuff and then the next thing you know they'd all, they'd all either degraded or gone again you can unlock um, stuff through the in-game xp system can't you on mm-hmm. blacklight so i i, I still prefer the I original black lights the new one i have to say it's kind of a, it's gone in a direction i'm not entirely satisfied with really well, it's just a deathmatch shooter now isn't it yeah just another counter-strike it, clone essentially it is there was, yeah. there was there was a lot of a lot more gameplay satisfaction from the first one yeah because i take it the first one had a single player campaign did it it kind of did it was kind of just a you know a by numbers kind of show you the ropes kind of thing yeah. Really. Concerning tribes, <laughs> I probably played tribes more than anyone else, you know, here. To be honest, I never spent I never spent even a pound on the game. And I do feel bad for, for that in retrospect. But at least I did support the game enough to pass on to others and convince others to, to get it and, and See, they that's why I think tribes spent is, money. That's why I think tribes is doing it so well, because you don't have to spend money on anything mm-hmm. to get all the enjoyment out of it. But Blacklight, if you don't keep buying these upgrades, then it's you're just going to be grinding XP to yeah, get upgrades punishes. that you're going to lose again. Tri- think- Tribes, Tribes was entirely down to the, the time invested, and I, I, I unlocked most of the classes and got most of the stuff, but still not. I, w- I still wasn't quite there. Still a lot I could have done, so yeah. Plus, the other major difference is, I mean, I mean firstly, you play, as you said, you, you were playing Tribes when the beta first started, essentially, mm-hmm. and I came to it last December. But looking at the difference between the way Tribes looked last winter compared to the way Blacklight looked when it launched on Steam. Tribes looks like something that you'd buy and get in a box and have a game that you'd take home. And Blacklight Revolution, it really, like I said, if, if your hardware is not bleeding edge, then it doesn't look that great for a free-to-play game. It's also got the most convoluted, annoying menu systems ever. True. Yeah, they're, so they are very busy. Screen, yeah. So much text on screen at once. Yeah, they've really gone for that homage to Minority Report. I think essentially, though, what people have to remember is that when the new Chives was announced by high res nobody was expecting it to do very well. It was an IP that people had more or less, you know, kind of abandoned after The Last Vengeance. Yeah, and it's been this huge. I mean, really, overstated just success massively. Even though it is free to play, and people say it's pay to win and everything else, but it's it's such a underneath all, all that. It's such a good it's, game. It's so. not pay to win though, is it? No. no. Pay to pay to win is when if you invest real money, you get bonuses that aren't available otherwise to anyone else. But that's not the case in tribes. You can get stuff through playing just normally. Mm-hmm. It just takes a little longer. Exactly, and that's what they've done. They've, they, I mean, with patch five, that they inserted a bunch of variant weapons to, to the ones that there were originally there, but they were ex- incredibly cheap. You know, they've, they've upgraded it so that uh, just using certain weapons now uh, you get XP on on that specific weapon every time you use it towards the next upgrade as well. Yeah. So it's they're making it easier. Absolutely. It's getting more refined. No, I mean, just look, look at the content that they've added since since the actual you know initial launch as well. Obviously, there has been that kind of thing where oh I don't really want to pay and these things for you know if I, only if I pay for it so, you know for certain things but the additional things like maps and other stuff has all been for complete you know free of charge I was yeah, happy with just no no paid DLC you no. just you just pay what you want mm-hmm. I think exactly. part I think the success of tribes is partly down to the timing with which they've released it as well for the last how many four five years PC gamers haven't really had much to choose from in terms of competitive multiplayer FPS games it's pretty much always been modern military shooter A versus military shooter B versus C or whatever it's all the same and then Tribes comes along and it's so completely different I think it's just refreshing for a lot of people and that's why it's done so well oh yeah and it's a reimagined old franchise that's actually it's had a good modern translation I mean there are yeah. some people I, mean, I don't know how much they've changed it from the originals because I didn't I, play any previous Tribes game. But. I can just about remember Vengeance, and the only thing I can remember from Vengeance, obviously I think David would more would know more about it than I would, but what I can remember is that everybody could carry a chain gun if they wanted to. It was something that they could buy, and it was a lot lighter. It wasn't assigned to the one heavy class. Like so it's it more, cla- more class-based now? Yeah. So it's sort of Tribes slash... Team Fortress 2 yeah. kind of vibe. Yeah, they've 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 found the perfect balance really between what you know really old fans from like Star Siege and everything wanted, and and what people who haven't played, played tries before wanted as well. You know, it's probably still a, a bit of a niche when you've well, got. It's been downloaded over a 
million yeah, yeah. times or something. Easily, yeah, easily yeah. a million times. It's, re it's really opened up the IP, you know, in comparison to the older stuff. So uh, has Liam not actually played it? I don't know. Uh, no, I've not played any of the Tribes games. Have right. you not? Found, have you not? You, you should know? get Ascend. It's free. Yeah. Don't even know why I tried Ascend out. I just saw people talking about it on the forum. I thought, oh, I'll give it a go. This could be interesting. Yeah, but, or, but and then you took, then you took a break and then you came back it. again, didn't you? As soon as I tried it, I just thought, wow, this is probably one of the most entertaining multiplayer games I've played since I got Team Fortress 2 about five years ago. And it's costing me nothing, yeah. And it's free, so yeah, I just yeah, excellent game, truly. And, and the whole game does revolve around teamwork. You've know, you got to be a cog in a bigger wheel to, to win the games, and it, it is, it's very rewarding when you do. As well as the team element, there's also the, there's also the time element, where if you, go, if you look at the wiki, there's a certain mathematical equation for the actual length of time that a game lasts since the, since the game can if, if a game stretches all the way out to 35 minutes then everybody gets more xp than they might have done normally but then after that it's all about the rankings on the on the scoreboard and then whether you win we can all kind of think if, if it on retail only and not free to play how, how would it be doing in, in comparison to how it's doing now i don't think it would have sold yeah because uh, high-res studios aren't the kind of well that first of all they don't have a publisher behind it do they because mm -hmm. it's free to play so they would have had to secure a publisher and then they're not the biggest studio ever so they obviously wouldn't have had the marketing campaign that the likes of call of duty and medal of honor get so it, it, they would have put a box on the shelf and not many people would have known about it and i don't think it would have sold very well at all really yeah i, I think i think social networking's i think facebook's really helped them out high res were pre previously on and on for the mmo that they did uh, global which, agenda yeah so it kind of had a it had an appeal to some but it wasn't exactly a huge you know success for them so they weren't ideally they weren't really everyone's thinking oh God, you know these guys can't can't really deliver on this and and they've absolutely they've exceeded expectations yeah. you know which has been which is just really you know kudos to them in every absolutely. in every sense and the really good thing is that yeah as you say you can start it and stop it wherever you like i mean in my case i've i've put I mean, since last December, I've put in 305 hours uh, in terms of the amount. And yeah, but that's that's obviously compare that to Left 4 Dead and other games where I've put a lot of time in. But th those games are two and three years old, as, and it took me that long to get to 300 hours. On this game, as I said, because the, because the XP is partly time based as well as team based, that plus buying some gold. Has, has helped me master six out of the nine classes. The only three classes that I've left are the ones where they had the largest premium bundle packs. And it's not a, it's actually not a, it's not an obsession with unlocking everything because classes like the Infiltrator, they will be playing a very, very different game to the kind of path, very fast Pathfinder. The, the thing with it though, it just, it never, I remember, I remember when I first looked at some of the weapons and, and they might have XP and say it's to unlock and you just think, my God, that is going to be such a, you know, a chore. But it, it isn't, you kind of forget that you're getting this XP, you know, it's, not your determination you know to, to keep playing because the game itself is just so fun and team orientated and exactly you know every, everything like that it's and and the next thing you know you've got the xp without really kind of focusing on it too much like you do in other games absolutely and the other good thing is that now with the with the system changes that mentioned by dave the fact is that you can just save up fifteen thousand and then mm -hmm. click a button and that's it it's masters yeah so people like me where i'm just thinking i don't want to have to fight with a kind of gypped version of the same weapon i just want you know if i'm going to use it i want it to work you know effectively save up 15k it's mastered end of story tribes tribes ascend just feels like a real kind of a reward to pc gamers in you yeah. know like dave said it earlier we, we, the, what we've had to put up with the last few years and oh god and it's kind of like yes yeah, this is just specifically for you this is what we know you want yeah Oh yeah, because they, they they it actually got canned on consoles. Yeah, they just said forget yeah. it, it's going to be PC only. There's there's no there's no need whatsoever for them to take us consoles now, and, and, it, and I doubt it. But I just can't see it working on there anyway. The game's even taken off quite well as an eSport as well, which is something that Vengeance never managed. Yeah, Absolutely. they implemented features onto the menu where you could watch live casts of it and stuff, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can spectate games. They're 88,000 and not 100,000 XP. I mean, Dave, I've got major respect because you've unlocked at least one or two weapons that were 100,000 XP. So yeah. if you weren't even making 1,000 a match, then you were playing over 100 matches. <laughs> a good new weapon. And yeah. yeah. I couldn't even. I couldn't even imagine that. I've taken a break for a reason, my mate. <laughs> well, exactly. 
<laughs> I think I play maybe two matches a night every couple of days. Yeah. It's slow. It's very slow. It's slow for me. El Gaucho was the newest forum member to buy it. And yeah, when he saw the, the discounted deal, he just snapped it straight up because he's after one of the infiltrator's weapons, which is 88k, the one that, you know, the one that fires sticky grenades instead of having to throw them. Trying to get... He's, he's on 24,000 after two, three months without any boost. So yeah, I mean, telling people... You can have 50% more XP for life. It's just an incredibly clever business offer. Maybe they already did it with Global Agenda and passed it on and put it in tribes. But yeah, brilliant idea. I'm happy with it. There's lots of moaning and complaining, but they, for a free-to-play game, people don't realise what they got. It's basically give PC gamers something to be passionate and proud of again. You know, And there's not been yeah. anything like that for quite some time on PC. Exactly. But cool. some, some of the players also can just If you just watch some YouTube videos, absolutely insane. Yeah. When, when you think you've got to a level in the game where you think you're quite competent, you, you could just watch one of those videos and just feel like just quitting. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, just, it's ridiculous. But that's good because it really attests it to what, whatever level you're at, uh, you know, play style or there's always going to be someone better, but you can still be prominent in the game and, yeah. and you, can, you can still get the top of the leaderboard like I did quite often. Um, mm. and I, I yeah okay, but even, I'm saying I was nothing compared to what these guys were, but I could still I could still get there. Yeah, that's the other good thing that the in-game credits, those scores, you've got to make sure that you actually spend the points that you're amassing because then they feed into accolades, which then feed into XP. Yeah, so as long as you get loads of points, yes, you get higher up the board and you get a little bit more XP. Sorry, I should also add that a lot of the time I, I, I was at the top of the board without that many kills because I was playing my role in the game. Yeah, for whatever class I was. Exactly. That was giving me all the points, so not always down to kills. And also, there's also there was also a perk called I think either determination or bounty hunter, one of the two. That means that when you didn't touch the flag and you got killed, then you got you get a few more points. But that helps out the classes where where you, maybe you're stuck in one place. But the other thing, what the other weird thing was, there's this maybe because there's a there's an accolade and badge for it. There's an obsession with destroying the generator and trying to repair it. Mm -hmm. There are some maps where it, it really really matters, but there are other maps where you're thinking, well actually, it's a, all that happens is when you go and repair the generator, it will automatically repair itself in four and a half minutes, and a match lasts up to 35 so on the maps where the generator doesn't matter you, you sometimes wonder to yourself well what why are you camping in there worrying about fixing it all the time when you could go off and do something else to help the team and in five minutes it'd be fixed anyway is it true that they've on on the rain dance map that they've made another entry point into the yes the they adjust they adjusted it and right, so you go inside the normal entrance and the new entrance is at the top floor, right. which is ground level. Yeah, that's good. At least, at least it shows they are listening then. Exactly. It, it was a real, I mean, you could just... You spend Isn't that the one where there was just one little door? Yeah. And, and you dropped out, and yeah, I didn't like that. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, they, yeah, so they've, they've redesigned it now. It was there a was some, to the there extreme. Was, there were plenty of people just, just camping in there and stretching the game out. And, you know, there's no point getting... There's, it's all about the quality. There's no point getting more XP for a match if you've been bored rigid. All right, walking well. I think that's Tribes covered. Absolutely. Excellent well, game. Free to play, go, go and play it. Precisely. Let's stick on free to play because it's Liam, who's who you haven't played tries, but you've been playing loads of Defence of the Ancients 2, Valve's yeah. old classic, yeah. which they're bringing back. So tell us some more about that. There are no weapons it's like in Tribes, where you, is, if I understand correctly, um, you can only get the weapons in Tribes through XP. You can't get, you don't just get them randomly. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the thing I like about the Valve model of free-to-play games is you get all the content up front. There's no unlocking, and the only unlocking you do do is for cosmetics, and there is a lot of cont content in Dota. There's something like 100-plus heroes. There's going to be 50-plus items. Every hero has something like uh, four abilities, and they're all, they're all like wonderfully modeled and animated and voice acted. So you're really getting a lot of content for absolutely free. You can buy it at the moment for something like 20 quid, an invite, but um, it will be free eventually. You get these cosmetics at the end of every match. You get XP, XP which unlocks new content every, every time you level up. And I think the reason they did that is um, sort of incentivize staying to the end of a match. Because it's one of those games where it really sucks when you're losing and it's great when you're winning. It has this sort of uh, snowball effect as you play. It's very where... easy for people to rage quit, is it? The teams yeah, just exactly, drop off until exactly. it's, it's six on one or whatever. So you still get rewarded even if you lose? Well, it's, it's a, so it's a five on five team game. And the reward for staying at the end is you get some XP, which eventually leads up 
to some random cosmetic item. Right. But like I say, the cosmetics don't matter at all to the game. You get the full game for free. Um, okay. But um, as you play the game, it has this sort of snowball effect where all the decisions you make in the f- sort of first five to ten minutes really get magnified in the end game. By the point you know that your team is going to lose by sort of about 15 minutes in, but you still have to play the full 45-minute game. They can oh, last up to an hour, minutes. can't they? Wow. Yeah, can, they can last over an hour. So that's um, really trying people's patience if they have to go 30 minutes knowing they're going to lose. Do you think just the, off the, the potential of getting like progress towards a, just, just a cosmetic item is enough to make people stay until the end? Well, they do also punish for leaving. You get put in a sort of low-priority matchmaking pool if you leave too soon. I think people do stay to the end to get these hats and wands and crap. Yeah, if, if, if there's anything that Team Fortress has taught us is that people will go crazy for hats yeah, yeah. and glasses and whatnot. But it's, it's such a harsh game for new players to learn because there's just so much new information you've got to take in. I mean, like I said, 100 heroes, each with four unique abilities, and you have to have a pretty good understanding. Well, that's 400 abilities that you have to have a pretty good understanding how they work to play the game well. Yeah, yeah you don't just need to learn your hero. You need to learn exactly what's coming up against you as well. So As you play the game... I mean, now I'm just talking about one 45-minute game. You earn gold, and with the gold you buy items to upgrade your character. So you also have to have a pretty good understanding of all these 50-plus items and how they work. And they give you know stats like bonus armor or bonus damage or whatever. The upgrades just... are tied specifically to the game then, are they? So every game you start from scratch. Yeah, every game you start from level zero, and it's like... So, just, full so it's, up... like having, it's like playing a strategy game and having a tech tree then, basically. Yeah, it's like having the full RPG experience in 45 minutes. You go from level 0 to level 25. And uh, actually, I think that's one of the main reasons I keep going back to it. It's just really addictive to sort of learn your character. And you get this sort of, um, as you're playing, you get this sort of immediate satisfying response of leveling up every few minutes. And you also get this, well, I don't know, it just somehow it makes you want to play it again to learn your character. Beach has been, as you say, very yeah. open-ended, very long long running yeah i got an invite randomly and i've i've already put in something like 170 hours over how many months two months when does it actually release and come out of beta well like all valve games i don't think they have a date but but it's nearly finished isn't it they're just refining bits i think they'll probably release it once they have all the heroes from the original dota which is 100 and i think they're on like 83 at the moment so i would say it's july now yeah i would say a few months and they'll release it maybe that maybe they'll just They'll just go for the Half-Life thing and just, you know, release it in November. People who, who they feel loyal to Valve, they can just go and buy a load of these cosmetic items. Yeah, you can buy. The cosmetic cosmetic items, are, t- are they tied to specific characters? Or when you've bought it, can you put it on any character you use? I think it's like Team Fortress 2, where it's mostly character stuff, but there are some items that... Well, actually, I'm not sure. I think, actually, it is all, is all items for just one character. Because the, the Team Fortress 2 model has been incredibly successful yeah well that since, oh, since they went free to play and they put the, the market on with the crafting system and stuff valve have made a a bomb of money out of it so yeah well, dota 2 is going to be like that but on a much larger scale because there are so many more i mean there are only nine classes in team fortress 2 and look how successful that was and they've mm. got 100 heroes here oh, wow yeah, yeah, so Pre- endless, people, endless. Will, people will want to spend money to customize it so that everyone looks individual and unique and whatnot. Yep. Yeah, endless replay p- potential there. And of course, it's on the Steam Workshop where I think I guess they're banking on uh, people making content. I think they recently said they don't really make content for Team Fortress 2 anymore. They just sell player created content. <laughs> yeah, excellent. And that's what you need, yeah. But that's a nice link, actually, because obviously we, we, you know, the one of the good things about about their praise for podcast is that we have at least one in-house map developer in Liam. Uh, yeah. You've you've created your own three map portal campaign, haven't you? Yes. Yes. So, and I know that if basically if you're not into portal, it's fiendishly hard. <laughs> yeah, people tell me. Hey, that. I quite like Portal, and I found it difficult. So yeah, well, I've, yeah. I've had I've had a lot of responses, and some of them loved the fact it's hard and told me to make more hard maps, and some of them absolutely hated it, and or were I think not afraid it's, to tell it's me. It's nice so. to have a challenge, though, isn't it? Because the Portal 2's campaign isn't particularly difficult, so it's nice that when you you can download a custom map that really 
makes you think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Especially especially the second room on the second map. So I got a little stuck on that one, I have to say. Second room, yeah. It's it's an easy solution. It's just working out and that's the hard bit, which I think is the, the best way to make a portal map. I mean, there are some portal maps where the trick is some awkward, like you have to stack cubes or you have to... Like use some weird physics glitch to get it to work, or yeah. you have, or you have but to yours, have sort of yours, and yours are much more like the actual campaign maps in the sense that once you've spotted it, you can do it straight away. Yeah, exactly. You don't need any sort of lightning reflexes to, um, or any sort of uh, sort of twitchy jumps. It's all logic based. Yeah, yeah, and it's 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 really worked out quite well. Although my advice is play it in the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> Late at night, oh god, do your brain in. You've put 170 hours into Dota 2, just yeah. playing the game, over two months. How many hundred hours went into creating those nine levels of three portal maps? I'm, I'm not sure about the actual hour count, but I started it sort of very quickly after Portal 2 was released. And I've been working on it pretty much all the way up until the workshop launch. So I think it was about a year I was working on and off on it. So, yeah, it must be close to about a 1,000 hours or something. It takes a yeah. long time. Hammer is not the, the kindest of tools to use if you encounter problems with it. Did, okay. did, you, did you have any problems, or did it, was it all fair? Oh, yeah, it, it was a complete sort of learning experience for me. I mean, I built, I based the first part one of Decay on a Portal 1 map I'd made. And um, even that map, even though it was terrible, even that map took a few hundred hours to make. I think I think that's obvious actually when you play through them in order I think it's obvious that you were learning as you went along because not only do the puzzles get more complicated but just the maps in general get better presented as they go along the third one in particular I thought was really good yeah yeah well by that point people were so sick of lasers that I decided to change it up <laughs> that's why there's no lasers in the last game yeah what we'll do as and when this is uploaded to YouTube check out the description screen and you'll be able to link to Liam's campaigns so if you own Portal 2 on Steam you just subscribe to his channel and you'll be able to play all three of his campaigns. Yeah, the work Steam Workshop is really good for the whole content sharing thing I think. I think it's definitely one of the best things Valve have done in the last few years. They're really helping the whole modding PC community out with it. Did you use the uh, the in-game editor for Portal 2 or did you just exclusively use Hammer? Um, when... Well I'd already, I'd already completed Decay by the time that um, the Portal 2 in-game editor came out. So I, I just released it straight onto the workshop on pretty much day one. I have used the in-game editor just to, just to play about with it. I released one map. It wasn't very good. but uh. No, the, the in-game one is quite basic, I think. It's really difficult well, it, to really shape geometry to how you want it. You are sort of confined to pulling the squares out and shaping the room. Yeah, although I think Portal 2 does lend itself to this kind of in-game editor because everything is already so modular so sort of square and rigid and you don't really need a lot of complicated geometry i did um, like it when i tried it, it it'll be a lot it'll be a lot anyone harder with a little anyone with a, just a little idea can just quickly pop on it and make something yeah i think the best maps um have been uh, people have tried out some concept on the in-game editor and then exported it to hammer uh, to yeah. really um because then you can add scripts and yeah, really exa exactly displace yeah. this, the uh, the walls and whatnot exactly Put different props in. Yeah, I hope I do hope that Valve takes the ideas that they've put on Portal 2 and applies them to some of their other games. I really like to see editors, well, just more content sharing for maps on Team Fortress and Left 4 Dead and stuff like that. Well, with the yeah, I mean, with Left 4 Dead, they kind of adopted community campaigns, but then they only left it at uh, one or two, didn't they? Yeah, I think going forward, all Valve games are going to be on the workshop going forward. So I think uh, CS:GO. Is definitely going to have workshop integration, and there is there is sort of a problem with it though that I can foresee in the future, in that Portal Two is a very contained game. It's a single player experience or co-op. That's it. You download the maps. It's really easy to share everything. It's like downloading a mod for Skyrim or Oblivion or whatever. But with games like Team Fortress and Left 4 Dead and Counter Strike, it's multiplayer. So all of this content that you can access on the workshop is going to have to be downloaded to every individual server that runs it, and there's going to be because yeah. I, I think that's why Left 4 Dead co-op didn't really. Uh, modding didn't really take off because when they originally released the SDK for it a few maps did pop up but then you could never find servers that were running them so very quickly you'd find like that there was no one playing all of these really good custom maps 
Yeah, if they can build the system so it's sort of as good as Portal 2, where it all happens in the background, really. All you have to do is subscribe to the map and that's it. Then I think they can make it work. It's just a matter of making it streamlined. By the end of the year, uh, be a system not like that in place, and it will. It, well, the, it, the it workshop will... already works with, with Team Fortress, obviously. Right. Because that's because people make their own uh, models for weapons and hats and accessories yeah, but... and stuff like that, and then they release it onto the workshop, and it goes onto the store for people to buy. I'd like to see Team Fortress maps on there as well, though. Yeah, exactly. I think I think it will come eventually. Because more, just more support for it in general would probably really help it thrive in terms of how much community content was actually put out there. Because I made a Left 4 Dead map, and then I never got around to publishing it because there was just no way, no way of anyone playing it, no real way to publicize it. Yeah. And it just, it just sort of went forgotten. But with Portal 2, it's a lot easier. So if they just took those ideas and put them into the other games completely then i think it would really benefit because team fortress is making them a lot of money so there's no reason why they wouldn't want to keep the ball rolling put in map support yeah oh, I, th- I think this is one of the main reasons they're making a new counter-strike is so that they can integrate all these new team features instead of just sort of um uh, up- upgrading counter-strike source which is getting a bit old now counter-strike is also a very very heavily modded game isn't it yeah. yeah, lots of a lot of custom maps for 1.6 that I've played in the in the past. Yeah, so having a workshop to share those on would be very good. So within an, I believe it will take till the end of the year for all these things to be realised. Obviously, with CS:GO coming along, that's going to be the paid, the paid thing, and they've and they've decided to fix the price at whatever, I think at whatever whatever ten dollars, either ten or fifteen dollars. That's the, they, they've picked one fixed charge all over the world for it so it's going to be very cheap then Dota 2 is going to come out that's going to be free to play but play the long game and get money out for that so the future is looking quite bright for Valve and it's quite amazing that at least they are announcing lots and lots of things so that I'm, I'm not bothered about Half-Life 3 well I think Dota 2 is going to be massive because um, it's, it's, it's still invite only and it's, sti- it's already the biggest game on Steam Yeah. and if you look at the Steam graph for every other Valve game you see this sort of um, peak and trough of the graph of player numbers and it sort of goes down in sort of the early hours of the morning. With Dota 2, it's pretty much constant. It's so so clearly it has sort of a global appeal. Yeah, exactly. And, and in it fact... It really appeals to the hardcore, I think. Uh, yeah. yeah, but then I didn't know there was that many hardcore players. It has sort of a constant 55,000 players constantly. That's pretty good for a game that's still in, invite only. Oh, yeah. I haven't got an invite yet. <laughs> uh, I'm happy. I'm given, given the 400 different combinations of hero and ability, uh, I think I'm happy to wait <laughs> until it's out. The E3 stuff. Uh, Dave, you wanted to talk about Watch Dogs. Only in kind of a... It was really the only exciting thing to you know to be shown. It was certainly the best trailer of the E3, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Just, it was just a massive surprise. I just I remember. I'll always remember the when we were chatting on the forum while we were watching it live. Yeah. And everyone was just kind of okay. What, what is this? What seriously? What is this? What is this game? No, nobody had an idea. I think Ubisoft really knocked it out of the park with that one. Um, it kept it a well hidden secret, and it was it was game of the show. You know, absolutely, yeah. For that, because it just came out of nowhere, and they they yeah. played this sort of intro video of this sort of hacking paranoia. Uh, everyone's watching you. Everyone's controlling you. Type. Yeah, of, they set uh, the scene. Yeah, and then they go straight into gameplay, and you're not even sure what you're watching. You're just seeing some guy walking down the street, and you're thinking, what is what what what's the gameplay here? And then this sort of series of events unfolds, and you and you left sort of thinking how much of that was scripted how much of that was just sort of dynamic stuff happening in the world it was it was, it was just it was kind of captivating because you, you're not really used to those kind of surprises because everything i mean everything and anything everything usually gets ousted you know the week before or something so even from like liam said even from the very moment where it first started we kind of is this gameplay is this cgi what what is this um it was really hard to tell what was really scripted, was. what was scripted and what was gameplay mm-hmm and it just kind of it just kind of defined itself and just kept going and, and getting more and you know just better and better as it went and progressed and then it just kind of just whoa okay just it's it like just... it's like this bizarre mix of Hitman, um, Deus Ex, and GTA all in one bizarre game, mm-hmm. and somehow it works with multiplayer. 
Yeah, with with co-op multiplayer. Yeah, it was. It, I mean, E three was really really kind of standardised, and that that was really such a such a it was such a welcoming thing. It was just like yes, thank something to be excited about. At last, well done, Ubisoft. No, I'm not sure it's actually going to live up to. Well, the, I mean, the extremely high bar that it's just set itself because I can, I can see it sort of struggling to really make a whole game out of it. I think I think it was more to do. I mean, yeah, we can all kind of calm down now and think, yeah, okay, so, but what will it really be? It was just it was just during the actual event. It, it made such a big impact. The buzz surrounding it was was just phenomenal. We've got to kind of really think, yeah, okay, so what is it really going to be like now compared to that? I think people were just happy that there was actually something worth getting excited about. Uh, exactly. What was, other, was, what was otherwise an absolutely dreadful E3. I, exactly. I, can't even, I can't even think of anything else that was particularly impressive at the time. Wasn't Apart it just from, more sequels? Yeah, Beyond, I think. There's people that made Heavy Rain. That looked all, uh, pretty good. Is that the one with Ellen Page? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but aside from that, everything was just dire. I mean, considering that Nintendo were meant to be revealing the next generation console that they're putting out. It's just a, it was really shocking. <laughs> it was qu- quite bad this year. Well, maybe that's that is why it's so bad because they're all working on the next gen stuff. But bad was an understatement, really. Was with Nintendo, wasn't it? It was an absolutely cobbled together, you know, completely non-informative. I don't everything. understand how they got it so wrong. Yeah, because because I watched the pre- the pre presentation they did the night before or two nights before, where. The Japanese guy, Iwata or whatever his name is, he unveiled all the hardware behind it and said, "This is the controller, this is the, the Wii, this is the the, the Wii verse with the uh, Dark Souls kind of style messaging system where you, it's like a social network, and this is how it all works." And now, when we do our conference, we're just going to talk about games. And then they did the conference, and they said everything again that they'd already covered. And they they, they announced how many games? Nintendo Land, which is sort of like the Wii Sports. Mm release game that's probably going to be bundled with the console and Pikmin 3 and beyond that it was just there was just nothing it's, oh dear. it's like I kind of covered it was it was like that was it was it was a pivotal moment where everybody was willing to let the, the Nintendo brand back into their like gaming lives again and the window opportunity was there and they absolutely just completely sunk it and yeah I sat down and I thought just before okay come on Nintendo impress me yeah make me want a Wii U because I could get excited for this exactly <laughs> Everyone was then, thinking that. And then I just couldn't stop laughing all the way through the presentation at how bad it was. My housemate and I sat watching it together and we were just in a state of disbelief. It's like, how could they get it so wrong? Mm-hmm. I, I just can't make any, any logical sense of, of what, they, what they did. I, I just decided at the last minute, okay, we're not really going to do what everyone's expecting. I, I don't understand. And I, it's magic e for your moments where you'll always question it. I think the problem was is they, they tried to appeal almost entirely back to the casual audience again who had the presentation. Like, oh, look, this is how we can play all these family-oriented games with the new controller and whatnot. But that's not what people wanted. Not at E3, no. People were, people were sick of the Wii by now. The, con- the whole novelty of it is worn off the sales are starting to slow down and yet well everyone's got they, one you have the wanted one yeah and they expect people to get excited for this what is essentially a, a, just a wii with a new controller but zombie you actually look quite impressive you know to a degree i thought it, it, it's just the whole where i'm looking i'm looking at the screen i'm looking down looking up and i don't see I how think that, works that was with probably the, the only title that really stood out amongst everything else they showed apart from that god awful holding up the controller to use it as a sniper scope aiming yeah. at your screen. That was probably one of the stupidest ideas. But, but they're, the, they're, the seeing it as in, they're seeing it as innovative, though. They're seeing it as this is what people want to actually do. And um, we don't. I mean, I, just, I can't see myself playing like that whatsoever. Well, it's, it's definitely innovative, but whether you can say it is in a good way or not, I, mm. I don't think so. No one wants to have to hold up their controller to their screen and try and line it up on the screen. It's, I mean, it's okay when they're doing stuff like that because we know it's kind of smoke and mirrors, but in practicality, how is it going to be? It's probably well, yeah, it's, I'll tell you what it's going to be like. It's, it's going to be like those iPhone commercials where you talk to your phone and Siri talks back to you. And in the adverts, it looks wonderful, but it, out in the public, if people think you're... You're a mint patient. Nintendo just can't decide what market they're aiming for now. That's I, I really don't know what they're going to do now because they've they've kind of you know they're losing the 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 casual side slowly but surely, and the other side they should have captured at E3, uh, now in complete disarray over what the hell it is, what it does. Yeah, I don't think do, the casual do audience is going to buy into the Wii U as much as they did with the Wii. I think they should stick with 
what they do best and that's games they shouldn't worry so much about the hardware and they should make more games for other platforms so, I mean, yeah they should they're... become a third party developer like Sega hmm. yeah well not as well no not like Sega <laughs> <laughs> so, so we can have Sonic again and again and again progressively getting worse it's, it's hmm. just the only people who didn't realise what people expected at Nintendo when Nintendo they didn't announce just... very many first party titles either and that's really no. what a lot of people were excited about because last year when they announced the Wii U and they showed what could be running on it they showed a tech demo for a new Zelda game and then that was just non-existent they haven't even announced that they're making one people wanted to see even even existing you know Data Siders 2 and other things that have been announced for it they just wanted to see it running on the hardware how, how difficult would that I don't know how difficult didn't that they would show be. the same the same show reel that they showed last year yeah. Yeah, of it, it was just the same, on, the same the video. Footage from PS3 and Xbox games. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that, how I don't. How, it was the ultimate fail. I mean, and they, they made a, they made a big deal out of uh, the older games com- that came out last year on the current generation, coming out with a couple of new features on the Wii U as well, like Batman. How now you can use the gyro in the in the controller to sort of steer batarangs that you throw. And I think that with Mass Effect 3 is coming out on the Wii U with a couple of extra features built into the onto the touch screen on the controller as well. Well, it's not yeah. a touch screen, I don't exactly. think. Exactly. And, and Nintendo are actually, you know, seemingly encouraging, oh, look, you will go out and buy this game again just for this extra... Yeah, Reggie, Reggie yeah. did an interview and said, oh no, it's a, Batman's a completely different game. There's new costumes and now you can control control the uh, the Batarang with the remote. It's a completely different game. Of course people are going to go out and spend $49.99 on it. <laughs> He's just <laughs> mental. No, no one's going to do that. Good old why, Reggie. Why would, why would I buy Arkham City again when I've played it? And... I wasn't even fussed about costume packs the first time, and that's your major selling point to me. Oh, I can dress as a different kind of Batman. Ooh. I mean, all, all in all, I mean, it's kind of like the the the, the company I was least I was expecting the least from, which was was Ubisoft, given the recent track record and you know recent history. They were the one who really kind of saved the show for me. And Ubisoft the had a good conference last year though, because last year they unveiled Far Cry, and that was a surprise. That wasn't known to be there. Yes, well, no, it, it, it was. I mean, it was it, at least it was known. You know, it was known, known. Whereas, whereas Watch Dogs was completely. Well, it was rumored. It hadn't actually been announced. Well, I it think sort uh, of been leaked. I think that Far yeah. Cry Three was going to make a appearance, <clears> but no one knew for sure. Just watched and then they came out with a pretty good demo. Secret. Well, but we saw some nice of Far Cry 3, actually. If anyone wants to refer to the co-op video they showed when on the PS3. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> that was... that just It barely looked playable, honestly. It, it was the way they did it. The, you know, the way they staged it, though, where, like, yes, you got to go, you got to the bridge. You, you know, and they tried to they tried to do it. Obviously, they think that's how co-op is actually play. <laughs> And and they got it all. Ca- on they the just bridge, got it. I'm on the bridge. Yeah, I'm they, down, got it, I'm down. they got it so wrong. Uh, yeah, and screen tearing everywhere. It was uh, running at about ten frames per second. Shadows slowly building up in front of you, five feet away. So much texture <laughs> popping. It's like yeah, I'm sure it, that tree wasn't there a minute ago. <laughs> yeah, Crisis Three, it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, didn't it turn out that was all acted anyway? I think one one of the demos. It turned out they were actually just mimicking, and uh, it was a video they were playing. And they were oh, just they were just talking they were talking over the top of it. I don't know if it was Far Cry Three. It looked too bad to be acted though. The co op video they showed was just dreadful. They if if that was a pre already done video, they would not have put that on E three. <laughs> they would they would have made an effort to like spruce it up a bit and actually make it look more presentable. It maybe really- maybe the Far Cry three demo that they showed was <coughs> pre footage. No, the, the, the co op the co op was as it happened, I'm I'm positive. <laughs> It was that poor. Yeah, it wasn't too good. But, okay, that's a bit of a surprise that, I suppose, as you said, there was a lot of hype about Halo 4 when it, when the, when really it's Halo 4. It's a different... I mean, I've got all the other games, but... Well, listen, Microsoft's that, conference was the worst thing. Right. It was dreadful. Reassuring us that they were supporting the, heart, the, uh, the core hardcore gamer by saying, we've got a new Halo game, we've got a new Gears of War game, and yeah. there's a new Forza game, and then Jump, everything else on. was Connect. Right. I don't know. The new, new, I actually quite like the look of the new Halo. I mean, because it's a new developer. Yeah. And you can see the. Isn't it, it's the same developer that made Reach, isn't it? It's the same. It's three four three studios, isn't no, it? No, no, it's the guys who did Anniversary. Oh yeah, three four three studios. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, Reach was Bungie, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. that was the yeah. last one. 
Yeah. So you can already see they've got they've, they've actually put their own visual stamp on the game. It's Halo, obviously, but there is a visual difference there. You know. I still find it very hard to get excited about games that I've played again and again and again yeah. already, though. But then you know we could do the whole Modern Warfare three and Black Ops two and everything yeah. else. So. Well, the difference. Well, well, that's the difference between COD, cash on delivery, and or Call of Duty and Halo. Is that I think. I think it was only Halo 2 that went down and had a really short single player compared to all the MP stuff. Whereas with Call of Duty now, that's it's like that every game. I mean, and like I said, I am waiting for Call of Duty. I'm waiting for Activision to just attach a, a gamepad-free mode, or even just sell the cutscenes on iTunes and just let us let us let us just buy buy the action film that they've turned it into and just not play the game at all. Well, Call of Duty has always been about the multiplayer. True. So I think they're, they're and they're gradually eclipsing the single player more and more with each release. So and I wouldn't be surprised if sooner or later Call of Duty because it's not going. Let's face it, it's not going to go on forever. People are going to get sick of spending fifty quid every year on the, what is essentially the same game. Yeah. So at some point they're going to have to say, okay, right, we're going to release it as a downloadable only multiplayer game on X on Xbox, PS3, PC with microtransactions and whatnot. Yeah. I don't know. The, Call of Duty Elite sort of taken it to that degree already because they've put a subscription service on it. Yeah. Sorry, Liam, you were about to say. I was going to say the yearly model works for FIFA games. Yeah, that's because football fans are football fans of that's because about buying new scarves every year and new football this every year. Yeah, football changes every year though because like teams change and players change and all that crap that I don't care about. But Call of Duty is fictional. Yeah. And and. This, let's face it, the story is not something that people should really care about if they have any semblance of... Well, that's what's annoying. I mean, the, when it comes to Black Ops 2, that's a really good storyline that's getting wasted, basically, in the single player. Well, who, who, who out of us here bought Modern Warfare 3? Anyone? No? Oh, God, no. No. No? Very no, with my feet. Had I think I bought Black Ops. That was the last one I got. That's the last one I bought. I mean, Modern Warfare 3 is the first Call of Duty game that I've actively just... Avoided, just not bought, not no interest whatsoever. But Black Ops Two, because I do prefer Treyarch as a, as a developer. Then I'm yeah, sli- World of War I'm, was good. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm slightly interested. World World of War was amazing, and, and on the online as well. I'm kind of peaked. I'm kind of interested with with it. I think the setting. I'm not sure about the setting with this one. It's so, futuristic, isn't it? Black yeah. Ops Two, near future. It's got a very kind of battlefield. Black Ops just Black Ops was Cold vibe. War, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So they've, Black they've Ops sort of skipped ahead a few. Yeah, yes. Black Ops. Black Ops Two. It's it's gone into a kind of Rise of the Machines kind of area almost. You know. Something. Yeah, but ultimately it's going to be the same. It's on the same engine. You've got practically the same guns, the same maps because they're releasing. They release old maps in DLC and whatnot. So you're not really playing a game that's any different. True. Because yeah, I I like the multiplayer for Call of Duty. I think it's probably it is probably the best military shooter multiplayer game that there is, there is available. But the one thing that I begrudge it is the fact that I have to buy it every year because like it's yeah. I mean not, yeah, not even Microsoft not even Microsoft Office releases every year. Because every previous. every time they release a new one. The, pr- the player base on the previous one just shrinks. There's nobody plays Modern Warfare <laughs> 2 anymore. And, I tell you, and they, and they just so happen to let people cheat. It yeah. It's like a swarm and, of bees that just kind of goes. <laughs> yeah, and I just, I, just, yeah. I just can't be bothered to keep up with it anymore. As much as I enjoy playing it, so it just it's too much money for what is essentially the same experience every year. And also, it's got. And also, got, it's also got to the point where the Steam version, the Steam version, they just have free weekends every six months, and you just think, okay, yeah. Free weekend, I can download it and have a go, and then uninstall it again. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure how we got onto this topic when we were talking about E3. Yeah. I don't well, know. I, well, I suppose in terms in terms of being excited about upcoming releases, and I think when it comes to anything Call of Duty related, the answer is no. Well, anything sequel related, because yeah. the, the Microsoft conference was just sequels. I think Sony de- definitely outshone everyone this year because they really sort of showed a dedication to just wanting to make games. True. They said, oh, people, people have people have got the the PS3 now. We don't want to go to PS4 just yet. People are re- the developers are really starting to get the most out of the console. Let's make some games for it. Yeah. So Na- Naughty Dog are doing Last of Us, which looks pretty great, and then Beyond's coming out. Yeah, they do have a lot of good buzz for their upcoming stuff. God of yeah. there's a new God of War coming out, which is I still I still, I don't think that series has run its course just yet. No, no. There's all the general non-gaming stuff. I mean, like I said, my 360. If you can watch, if it's got 
access to everything except the ITV player on it, then yeah, I'm not, it's not going anywhere to, anytime soon. I've only had it a year. You see, I think my, my, I, Microsoft are much m- more focused on turning the Xbox into a media center. Yeah. Whereas Sony don't really care about that so much. They made a couple of announcements. I think Netflix and some sort of Amazon service for subscriptions yeah. to television in, in the US. But that that was literally Jack Trayton was like, yeah, we've got these. And now let's talk about games for the next hour and a half. Whereas Microsoft made a big deal out of God knows how much crap for the television and subscriptions and right. being able to w- listen to music and yeah. oh, And I suppose that, I suppose that actually forty minutes. Yeah, yeah, that is right. And I suppose the thing is with the BBC's policy of always making sure that the iPlayer is free on any platform, on any machine where you can access it. Yeah, I suppose. at least Sony got to the games and then they actually offered you know free games. Yeah. to uh, people with the, the Plus. Yeah, the Plus subscription yeah. changes that they made were pretty impressive as well, I thought. Very impressive. Whereas, <laughs> Ma- whereas Microsoft, you pay a subscription and what do you <laughs> get? You get adverts like, all over yeah. your dashboard. Yeah, it's like, give me money. Exactly. Yeah. I think it made, it, made the, it made the difference between the two even more substantial with things like that. They really do represent themselves. Or at least, they're, or at least Sony, they're doing a very good job of repairing any problems caused by their data leaks. The core gamer wants... A games console that plays games and that offers them good opportunities to get games for free or at discounts or whatever and that's what sony are really trying to push whereas microsoft have got it into their heads that well we're not going to compete like that anymore we're, we want a an xbox in every home and we want it to be the media hub of everyone's living room well it's the well it's, well, it's they, i think they've perfected the concept of the reverse atm <laughs> looking at that kid that racked up a bill of eleven hundred and fifty quid on his desk. Stupid Xbox. child. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, though. It's like I don't want a media center at my Xbox operating as a media center because I could build a media center PC that could do all of that without me having to pay subscriptions to Sky and to Xbox Gold and whatever and 4OD. else. Yeah. Whatever we all, else. We all have media centers. We all have them. Exactly. So, for just general gaming purposes, I just don't. I barely even touch my Xbox nowadays. It's just completely taken a back seat. Did you guys see the Kickstarter for the Android-based console? Yeah. It what raised. Has... It raised something like a few million in 24 hours, and it's now close to five million. It did wow. how much? It, it needed it for yeah. over the space of about a month, didn't it? And it yeah. just immediately got all the money. They gave themselves about two months, I think, and yeah, they they raised uh, about one and a half million on the first day, and now it's close to five million. Yeah, how do so you, you pronounce the name for the for the actual thing itself? Uh, I have no idea. That's why I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was way too far. It's either Oya or Oya. <laughs> yeah. Something pointless, anyways. Oya. Oya. Yeah, it's like an open source kind of thing, isn't it? With a. Uh... Yeah. Android based, open source, everything. Every, 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 every game has to be have to have has, has to have some sort of monetization on it, be it like microtransactions or Yeah, well it all has it all has to be free to play, at least in some sort of demo or some sort of limited free uh, part of the game. And right. then some and then optionally some monetization on top of that. So if it's open it's open source, all the games have to be F to P. I mean can you can I mean is it has it got USB slots for a keyboard and mouse? Um, I think they said USB. I'm not sure. It's got a, it's got a single USB. Yeah, oh, USB dumb, two. Dumb decision. Oh, actually, no. My well, brain's it's a, it's com- a sorry. console, though, isn't sorry, it? You, so. Sorry, my, well, it's, my mistake. So. If it's a single USB, you can just plug in a hub. Yeah, sorry. Well, it's sort of halfway between a console and a PC because it's it's sort of got that sort of open source vibe that you usually only see in sort of um, pure Linux builds. Yeah. And um, but it's meant for ease of use and plug it into your TV. So it's, uh-huh. it's kind of um, the best of both worlds. So if it takes off, it's sort of going to become like the indie, mm-hmm. the yeah. indie platform in a way. Yeah. But I wonder how it's going to launch because if it doesn't have games, people aren't going to make games for it. And if, if, so I, I hope some of this money, this $5 million is yeah. go, going towards funding some projects. So they actually launch with a sort of a large selection. So yeah, they, have they, need to. To, they need to show what it could do, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. People want to replicate stuff that they've kind of seen, uh, or, you know, alternative. So I don't know. It's, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a gray area, really what they've shown. So, yeah, let's see what he can do. Yeah. I certainly work, welcome the idea of sort of a new era of um, experimentation in games, 
maybe we've become sort of too too reliant on sequels and these companies are sort of too big to try anything new and if we do if we can open it up to everyone every indie developer and put everyone on, e- on an equal platform then maybe we, we will see a new area of a new sort of golden era of gaming that's sort of what steam Greenlight is trying to achieve as well though isn't it yeah exactly um valve valve says the cum- the community is fast um is smarter than they am uh, and like you say when it comes to them raising money that quickly when it comes to dota 2 having you know a set fixed number of players and growing and there's no there's no drop off depending on the time zone what's the rule with when it comes to unreal 3 engine de- development have you got to pay them some token fee um, or is it free I think um, UDK is free to use and you only pay if you make money off it after a certain amount. I think it's like $50,000 or something like that. I think it's okay. pretty, I think it's pretty um, relaxed. Yeah, you, you, you have to pay 25% and then, yeah, like, like Liam said, it depends on earnings past a certain point. Yeah. All right. Basically, that's, that, that's it for the brand new podcast for 2012. If you've been listening on YouTube, thank you very much. Leave us a comment. Tell us, tell us what you think. Also, tell us if the sound quality is okay. I know that we had a lot of problems in the past trying to make sure everything was all right. So as long as it sounds good, if it sounds good on YouTube, then the direct download shouldn't be a problem. So many thanks for listening. We'll be back as soon as there's more games news. So we'll, we'll aim for another one in a month's time, although there's no set regular date for these. It's just whenever there's enough for us to talk about. So just remains for me... We can me, be bothered. Just from... Not like that... <laughs> So it's just remains... another one in a year. <laughs> <laughs> it just remains for me to thank uh, David. Yeah, thanks. Liam's map designer. Thank you. And the founder of the of the YouTube channel and the forum Praise World, David. Camel. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks. Sorry, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm watching the Steam sales, so I'm kind of uh, distracted a little. <laughs> Oh dear. So if we hear about you being thrown out of your house, it's because you bought every game in the Steam sale. I have bought one so far. I'm, huh. I'm doing quite well. Okay. So, just basically, don't forget to check out the YouTube channel on YouTube. Go ser- go searching on Original Prey 1. That's P-R-E-Y. And also, the forum is now, it's just forum.praiseworld.com. That's P-R-E-Y-S hyphen world.com. 